Hello, my name is Claire Jackson. I'm the senior curator here at Broadway, and I'd like to introduce the wonderful Carol Campbell and Lindsay Young. Uh, Lindsay is the curator of the exhibition of Love and also works as the uh, curator of contemporary art at Tate Britain. So thank you both for coming today, and uh, I'll let you begin. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry, just to say we're probably going to um, talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. And turn to Thanks, um, Hi, everyone. We haven't really made any plans about what we're going to talk about because usually when we get together, we just end up nattering and gossiping and talking in a kind of free form way. So we thought probably best to do talk like that as well. Um, I would start by saying that this is one of the scariest shows I've ever done because everyone loves Stephen Campbell so much and a lot of people knew him. I never had the pleasure of meeting him. Um, a lot of people were, were friends with him or at uh, art school with him and it was a really, really intimidating thing to take on. Um, but it, I felt like I just, I had to because um, we're, we're going to talk about how the show came together but um, yeah, it felt like it had to be. But Everything I say is definitely like prefaced in that I am no authority. Like I was, I'm doing this on gut instinct and kind of working with Stephen's work, and I'm definitely not an authority. And I know there are a lot of people in the room who are who are doing PhDs on Stephen or who um, written about him. So it's a kind of different way of approaching it. Um, and as I said, that was a really, really good way to start. But it should be done in gut instinct because that was basically what the whole of Stephen's career. Oh, sorry. Right, we'll speak up. I'll use my te school teacher voice. <laughs> you hear okay now? Yeah, I'm just saying it was a good way for Lindsay to start the whole project, just to go with her gut instinct, because that was basically what governed all of Stephen's working principles throughout his artistic career. Um, and so the, the way that this show came about was I was working, um, I'd been at Inverley House for a number of years, and then I'd moved to the Scottish National modern art, it's still a mouthful, um, to work for a year on the Generation Project that was um, curated by Katrina Brown. Um, and she, or I'd been kind of put in charge with Keith Hartley of the Royal Scottish Academy building. So I was working with Martin Boyce and Carla Black, Rosalind Nashashibi, Christine Borland, and uh, putting together a group show. But the, the kind of the most complex thing to do was to restage on form and fiction. Um, and I'm ashamed to say, but I'm going to say it, that I really didn't have that much knowledge of that work. I knew the paintings um, from kind of collections that I grew up with in Scotland, but I didn't know that that work. So I um, read as much as I could and then started the process of kind of discovering or rediscovering the works. Visiting Carol at the, the House and Studio in Kippen. Um, I'm going down to Marlborough in London where the majority of those kind of works on paper still were. And that was really where things started to come together because I remember really clearly being in this room in a basement and then bringing out this kind of, sorry, slightly tatty box that I'm sure they've improved on now. Um, now it's at the National Gallery's um, go -no. Um But just pulling out these drawings and then completely blowing my mind, like each one being more incredible and more unexpected and just not the artist I thought I knew from the paintings. And then going to Kippen to the studio and um, finding things like the Papiamashia works that were there, um, and a whole kind of other series, a uh, series about football, about Alex Ferguson, um, that we're hoping that we'll maybe show at a later stage. Um, where was I going with that? Yes, so it was that, yeah, it was in that process of kind of discovering the form of fiction. And then I had another trip to Marlborough uh, to their stores and saw these collages, which I'd never seen before in the flesh. And um, they'd only been in one book that I could find previously. Campbell's, uh, sorry, Duncan McMillan's book on uh, stories so far on Stephen Campbell, which is totally brilliant. And there's a section devoted to these works. Um, and the only, I spoke to so many people because I was so worried about getting my facts wrong and I kept saying, I'm sure these haven't been seen, I'm sure there was nowhere else. And no one remembered having seen them at a show which was at Talbot Rice, except Michael Fullerton, who's like the biggest fan of Stephen Campbell. I was immediately like, oh yeah, no, I can remember every detail of every single collage that was in it. Um, and so maybe we should talk about how they were made because it's quite specific in terms of the way Stephen worked. 
Um, one of the things Carol would always tell me was that Stephen was incredibly impatient, um, so would be fairly demanding. He was incredibly impatient. I mean, and with my job being a primary teacher, I mean, you have set hours you have to work and you've got a class of children and you can't just walk out and leave them and, and I was always the gopher in the relationship you know I need a you know I need a, a white paint I need a piece of canvas and I mean it won't be the first time that he's like in the middle of the day I need a piece of canvas and I'll say but hey who's taking 28 kids you know that I'll get you later and I've gone home to find beautiful paintings cut up there's one fabulous one that's still in the studio, which is half of a painting, because you just simply couldn't bear to wait till I came home with a bit of canvas at like half past four. So you just chopped a painting in half and re-emulsioned the bit you wanted and started over. So that was kind of the premise of how you would normally go about working. Whereas I mentioned that only because these are in such contrast and it was such a different mindset. We'd come back from New York, and New York, you know, for anybody who's visiting, is such a full on, you know, 24 7 city. You're always on the go. These works, in contrast to the paintings, would take weeks and weeks and weeks of work to create them. Alive when Stephen would say, as reported in magazines, oh, I can do a, a, an oil painting in five days. That was a literal truth. He could do that huge oil painting in five days. He was very cerebral, so he would come up with the initial idea, but once he was in the studio, he treated it very much as a nine to five or a nine to eight, whatever you like, job. But that was his job of work, and he would go and he would paint and paint and paint. And so a huge painting would take that amount of time. But these took a long time to create, <coughs> and they were extremely painstaking. And it was building in many, in many different levels for our life. This was a whole new different life we were leading after New York. He wasn't perhaps just in the same level of public gaze. He was re-examining the whole principles of his art the artists that he really responded to, where he wanted to take his work, you know, moving ahead, and he wanted to create something that was lyrical and beautiful that hadn't been seen before, certainly not from him, but within the same, if you like, the same canon of images. I mean, I'm sure any of you who are familiar with his work, you know, you'll recognise like the, the hunter and the, the cypress trees and the chairs and everything has a resonance of Stephen. He always tended to inhabit his paintings in some shape or form, but never usually in a very literal sense. Although since his death, I've noticed more and more that I do see him actually in paintings. That I've never, when he'd show me them, when I would come home from work and go to the studio, he would show me something that I now see as being a self-portrait. But at the time, he didn't think it was a self-portrait, and I didn't think it was a self-portrait. I see that more and more. Like the, the I shot with something at Cow's Week over there. It's very much a self-portrait of Stephen. But you'll also see resonances of him in the artist's chair, which was a studio chair at that time, where he'll maybe put some um, object in, in place of himself, which I think is a common thing for artists to do. But anyway, to get back to the point that Lindsay had said, we deviated off, that Lindsay was making, like how these were made. And um, at the time, we lived in a farm away up in the hills above Kippen. And we had a tiny little blue, a, a, like a little mini ag, I think, a Rayburn stone. And above that, there were three dowling poles that could be used for drying clothes or whatever. And what he would do was he would paint just household string, balls of household string, just cut them into big long lengths, paint them the colours he wanted, drape them over these poles until they had dried. And then with a Stanley knife, start and cut them into from the tiniest minute you know two centimeter little piece and build up the image from that so there'd be a rough outline drawing done on the paper or the canvas and then this build up process would begin so you can imagine that that you know that's a real labor of love 
to work that kind of way. It was really intense for him. He would work, I mean, there were times when his hands, his fingers would be bleeding. He was working with a Stanley knife. But in a way, it was a, a reconstruction for body, soul, mind, for his art. But I think what Lindsay picked up upon, because she actually named the exhibition, it was you who came up with the title, Love. And I think that does really encompass what you see. It was love of family. It was love of art. It's love of nature. It was very much where he was as a person at that time. And, and we were talking earlier about, again, for someone who never had the debate to in, but there was always a sense to me in the way that paintings came across or were communicated or were presented by collections that was quite macho. We were kind of talking about yeah. this earlier, that was kind of very masculine and swaggery. Um, and it felt like there was a sort of different tone about these. And there was also um, Debbie Banerjee with this amazing podcast about the mixed media department um, at Glasgow School of Art. And there's this fantastic bit where Roger Hoare is talking about working with Stephen, and he said, um, oh yeah, no, Stephen um, was really difficult, and but then I met Carol, and I thought, he must be okay if that's his wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if we all stick with it, it must be all right. And for me, there was always, maybe from going to Kippen and seeing the environment that you worked in, but it felt like, not, you were definitely amused, I think, but it didn't feel just like that. It felt very reciprocal. Felt like two people in an artistic relationship, kind of um, like working off each other and fueling each other's interests and passions. And I think that there's something really fascinating about these in terms of the domestic. And there are children in all of Stephen's paintings from the very beginning, but there's something about the proximity of domesticity and the way that it's welcomed by Stephen, like it doesn't feel like it's something he's in opposition to, it feels like something he is very happy and comfortable with and that is fueling the practice, um, which is I suppose, like for that, that's always you in my head, that woman at the centre of the family with the butterfly wings and the children around. And it's, I think that's quite an unusual partnership and perhaps one that is different to how he's been perceived previously. Yeah, no, we were talking earlier and I was saying, I think in common with most artists, at least the ones that I've had the pleasure of meeting, um, artists tend in the main to have a, a very gentle inner soul because they touch with their feelings and what they're producing. And Stephen had very much developed his artistic persona to be very different to the man that he actually was, Stephen was, a really quite a shy, very gentle, very caring person. But he knew that to succeed in art terms, especially when he was first setting out in the, you know, the early 80s and going to New York, you had to have a persona, you had to be known, you had to become a performer. So if Stephen had been alive today, I wouldn't be here, I'd be in a bar round the corner somewhere and we'd have sat and had a drink and then he'd have come and he'd have performed for you as Stephen Campbell the artist in some you know great outfit they had found usually from Paddy's Market for those of you from Glasgow that was where all his best clothes came from but he would have been here and he would have done his performance as Stephen Campbell the painter, the collagist delivering a performance, but then come back to the pub and just being the ordinary man again, this very gentle, very caring person. But I think this actually, more so than the paintings, I think you see the under sound in these works that he's kind of allowed that to shine through here that you maybe don't see in the paintings, which are much more bravura. And I wonder if that's about the process of making, because he was always interested in you know, surrealism and surrealist writers and perhaps that kind of like automatic, I mean not automatic, it took weeks, but in terms of not having a plan. So Carol was just telling me earlier about to plan a painting, um, Stephen wouldn't make sketches, he would do almost, they're, they're really weird and kind of brilliant, these little diagrams, kind of a box with a word that leads to another word and maybe a stick figure for a, a yeah. person kind of plotting it out that way, but there wasn't that for these, they just came uh -huh. Yeah, I think it just kind of grew 
you know, that he would have the initial idea and he would start with the concept and maybe build the building or whatever and then build up from that layer upon layer. And I think because it was so expensive it, in a good way, it was that kind of rest for the mind. Yeah. Like it was just, he would have the initial idea, but then it would take such a long time to complete that it was simply for him the process of putting on the string. And I likened it, you know, a few times to that whole thing of when people came back from the First World War, the soldiers who were sort of mentally and physically at a, you know, a really low end, they would build incredible st structures with matchsticks, you know, the Taj Mahal made out of matchsticks and it was that thing, it was a, a healing <coughs> process, I don't really need to engage with anything other than what's going in my head and what I'm telling my hands to do with this process and I think that comes across a lot, I think, in these works. And they're around the same time, so they're kind of 88 to 92, 93? Yeah, around right about that time. Which is really astonishing when you think that that's so just when you come back from New York and then the whole of the making of On Form of Fiction and the whole tour of On Form of Fiction, which went to five venues, came back, I think, at the end of 1993. And those bodies of work are really distinct. He also did it at the same time he was working with Sting on his record. Yeah, he was working with Sting. <laughs> he worked with Sting. He designed Sting's record cover in really? 91, I think it was, for Soul Cages. So I gave my to find a copy of Soul Cages out of here. Yeah, I didn't find that. Um, it'd be interesting as well to talk about, I guess, that moment, I think listening to Debbie's podcast again this morning, it's really fascinating that kind of moment at Glasgow School of Art, the kind of mixed media course. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you want to talk about that, what that was like for you, because I think it, it seems to be a really kind of open, exciting, experimental, I think you described it as competitive, uh -huh. kind of quite thrilling environment. environment. So maybe talk a bit about right. well, the other things that inform the practice from that time. Yeah, well, I think um, Stephen absolutely loved the mixed media department. Well, the tutor that ran it at the time, Roger Hoare, who became a really close friend and who's still a friend of mine to this day. He, Roger Hartman, I think he was just such a clever, intuitive teacher. You know, they say sometimes, you know, um, that can do and those that can't teach but actually that was such an absolutely opposite of what Roger was about he was so intuitive he would never actually at least in Stephen's case his interactions with Stephen which is all I can talk about it was never a case of oh I think you should these might be the next steps for you Stephen would simply go in and he'd you know, he'd come back at night and he'd have a book, like the banquet years. Oh, well, Roger gave me the banquet years to read, or Roger left me this LP today. He said he thinks I might like this piece of music. So here was a man that could see in the student, oh, I know where this guy could maybe run with this. I'll give him the tools to do that. Let's give him some information. And of course, Stephen, you know, through artistic career was like a sponge once he, he would take something in he would run with it and want to find out more and more information and of course he'd the head he'd um gone to art school at the age of 25 which yeah. is a mature student and had been working for a number of years and and, so was still and, yeah. still worked, and had had read voraciously all that time so i think the idea of the, the kind of his kind of patterns of interest, so Joyce and Beckett and people like that. Um, maybe we should go back to that. What, that must have been really extraordinary meeting a kind of man like that when you were 16. Yeah, well, I'm 17. 17. 17. <laughs> yeah, I was 17, he had just turned 18 when we met. Um, yeah, and when I met him at first, he, he literally was, he was attending Bells Hill. He was trained to be a maintenance engineer with British Steel, as it was called back in the day. We met on holiday in Ostend, um, which I still love to go to Belgium, but it was just 
of the lap about the, the sort of difference in the character. Stephen and his brother accompanied his mother and father to Austin because it was a case of it was a free holiday. They had said, oh, you're not going anywhere, boys. We'll pay. You can come with Dad and I. So they went. We'd never normally have gone. This was a coach trip, by the way, folks, you know. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> back in the day, I think we were the only four people in the coach that were under about 50. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I went with my girlfriend, Janice. See, that tells you something about us as well, that we had actually booked to go on the coach trip <laughs> to Ostend. Um, so, you know, uh, so anyway, across a crowded bus, you know, eyes met, given that we're the only four people that are, you know, <laughs> any youthful persuasion, and kind of smiled, and that was it, you know. But as part of your deal on this coach trip, you got a ticket to go to the beer keller in Austin on the first night. So Janice and I, you know, Julie went with a little free beer token, you know, went in and here who's sitting, but as it turned out, Nettie and George, who became my, my mother and father-in-law, and Graham and Stephen. And so, of course, you know, Nettie and George were doing to the girls. <laughs> so we all started talking and yeah we did all sort of strike up a relationship and for that brief two weeks my friend Janice kind of went about with Graham who was Stephen's brother and mm -hmm. I was with Stephen but their relationship you know it was just a, a little holiday romance but Stephen and I then did agree that we would meet up and uh, met under the, the clock in Central Station mm -hmm. as you do. In a true glass region, you've all met under the clock and said <laughs> So we did that and then things developed from there. So when I did meet an artist, I met a young guy who was full of passion for life and initially um, his passion was channeled into politics and who knows where we might have been in Scotland, we might be independent for all you know if they kept going with that one. But anyway, yeah, it was very political, very left-wing, card-carrying member of the Communist Party. Went out, we canvassed, you'd come off a shift at British Steel and stand and hand out leaflets for the Communist Party. We would go to meetings down in one that sticks in my mind is the Party Borough Hall with Vanessa Redgrave up from London to represent the, you know, the Socialist Workers Party. So there was Vanessa and a couple of folk at the front. There was Steve and a wee drunk man that had come in out the rain into the party by a hall. And I'm sitting up the back trying to read Magatha Christie without being spotted. <laughs> and they're all talking, you know. And yeah, and yeah really, I always notice in all of these meetings, folk love the sound of their own voice. <laughs> I mean, everything was always a point of order, Mr. Chairman. And then they would just go off on a big rant about where they wanted nothing to do with what had been said before. So anyway, I endured all of that for a good couple of years. And then I think he just reached the point where he thought, you know, it wasn't really working for him. It wasn't giving him what he needed. And just at that point, his grandmother gave him a book to read about Toulouse Lautrec. Now it wasn't a, you know, a, a coffee table picture book, it was just a life story, just a little volume. Open art call and he made this head still with this sort of socialist leanings of John McLean, you know, from the, the sort of Red Clyde side and he did this bust head of John McLean and it was actually in, displayed in a shop window in Sucky Hall Street, I think. Uh, just below where the art school is now because there was venues right throughout Glasgow. It was just an open art call there was amateur artists and I dare say professional ones as well. So that was the kind of start of things. Then we did, we saved up after we got married and took, you know, this sort of what would be called a gap here now, although we went away for quite a year. But just sort of travelling around Europe, spent a lot of time then in France and Italy and then when we came back that was when we applied to go to art school and got in then as a mature student. And he played football for Scotland. And he played, yeah, he was the goalkeeper for the under 18s.
<laughs> Scott Road team. Renaissance man. Yeah, and I remember he played across in Ireland and we were just going together at that point. He brought me back a present in this back in the day where you actually got proper hankies, you know, nice little lace hankies in little boxes. And he brought me one back and when I opened it up, it had a G on it and he said, I just got you a G because they didn't have a C. And that was the performance one that we performed was the Via Light Nosier one that we did, that we, we toured with around the discos in Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> that was back in the day that was looking for anybody in my kind of age in the audience who would remember when it was a disco that you went to. And there was a 11 o'clock shut off for drinks. And if you wanted to have a late license, then you had to provide food. So at 11 o'clock, the lights would come up and a hatch would open and out would come paper plates with like a couple of lettuce leaves, a wee slice of tomato, slice of gammon and your plastic cutlery and that was your food and then after that, 15 minutes, hatch goes down, music starts up, you can buy your drinks again but they had to offer you that food. So on that 15 minute window of opportunity, we would perform Poison Mortar and that was how that came about. And um, those characters, um, I can never pronounce it, Violet, Violet Nocier, thank you. <laughs> um, who was a, obviously a real character, who was a kind of dark. Oh yeah, she's, she's a she's she's a real a real live well, dead now, but was a real life woman. Yeah, she was the, the darling of the surrealist movement. I don't know any of you who know about Violet Nocier. <coughs> uh, there was a film, a French film made about her with um, trying to think of the actress's name, she was in the La Dantillier as well, the lace maker, Isabelle Hubert. That's what it was. Isabelle Hubert played Violette Nozier. Violette Nozier was born into a very sort of bourgeois, middle class family. I think her father was some kind of railway official, you know, sort of managerial level, but she lived in a um, tiny little flat in Paris with her mother and father but in the confines of, like, she had a little truckle bed in their bedroom, sort of thing, so it was that slightly incestuous air, that's sort of bourgeois respectability, but she was quite a wild, free spirit, got engaged with a, a young guy who actually, in turn, sort of pimped her out to other men, but she loved him so much that she went along with this. The parents were very keen that she end this relationship, so she actually set out to poison her mother and father. She succeeded in poisoning her father, but her mother survived and turned to go and be witness against her in court. But Andre Breton, the surrealist, went into bat for her because he saw her as this great heron against this bourgeois society and sort of made up this case why she'd been forced to do this, hinting at there was some kind of incestuous relationship with the father, which the mother always denied, but which they were able to run with as her kind of defence. So instead of actually being put to death, she was sent to prison, but did get released and then later married. I think we want to have about four or five children of her own. And so like those kind of figures, those kind of like counterculture figures, as well as people that he invented himself, go through the whole one, the whole kind of uh, yeah. work. So Hunt was another character, wasn't it? Hunt was, was another character. He invented. he invented Hunt. Uh -huh. he, well, he was already, painting Hunt, but hadn't really found a name for him. And it was just, I think it was one day, his, his studio was always strewn with detritus, Stephen. Every studio that he never had, he never actually had, apart from New York. And even then it was a basement studio as well, without any windows. He never had great studios that were always, you know, kind of like Paris at the turn of the century. I think he was that kind of Calvinist thing, you know, if it's hurting you, it's doing you good, you know? <laughs> so I think that was kind of his premise and how he went about working anywhere. So who was I going with that? What were you? Hunt. 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 And all the, all the detritus, yeah. And he said that he looked down one day and this thing just sprung out at him, this name Hunt, and he thought, that's who you are. And the character that he painted, it was a kind of nod to Rose Selavig, 
um, in that it was of a gender neutral or transgender kind of character. It it was this man, always a sort of, the initial portraits had a sort of Otto Dix kind of feel to them, this kind of effeminate man in usually vests and with a sort of slightly fascist unsettling kind of overtone to them, like a sort of Berlin just a pre-war sort of feel to them and that was the initial hunts and then from there and um, my friends you've actually seen the painting in their house in London and they've still got the original painting and he made the, the figure in the painting is carrying a flag and he made the flag so I think that was why you then thought to include objects in this exhibition because quite often he did create an object to go with paintings like the Pinocchio tiles that he made for the Talbot Rice exhibition so quite often there was a kind of crossover in disciplines. And, yeah crossover and an expansion in a way that's really unusual or that it just didn't expect so the it's going on tangent but there's the psycho rug drawings that uh -huh. I'm completely in love with which are what, like A4 paper, um, really loose, beautiful drawings, but they're designed for rugs, for tapestries. Um, and I never expected to find anything like looking at paintings, uh -huh. you wouldn't imagine that those were there within the practice. But there's something, I can't quite make the connection in my head, but the, I think there's something there. Thinking about someone like Violet, who was a huge influence, who was against the bourgeoisie, who was against the kind of like normal way of living. All of the work seems to be about building an environment, and it seems that the pillars are like, are kind of there's strong distinctive male and female characters, this kind of socialist background, but then also the landscape of Scotland and the nature of Scotland. So it's almost like would you about it? Yes, he, he was. He oh yeah, he would, he would, he would, he would, he would. So yeah, it's almost it's like he's like the building building his idealised environment that has within it not the kind of normative gender roles. I don't know, maybe I'm like going too far. No, I think, no, this. I, I think um, no, you probably are right in that um, a bike and that was the only reason he went into the competition. I think again he was about eight or nine and he thought the prize was a bike and it was a boot token. <laughs> and he never ever got over that. <laughs> 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 I've got a book talking, <laughs> but he won. So. <laughs> there's, there's that painting in the, it's a Goma, isn't it? Oh, which one, the Defence of Migrants? Yes, yeah, which is very much about, yeah, it's very, like, yeah, well, it was a time, like, Croatia and the war and everything there. So I think it, I mean, it does have an incredible love of nature. And I think it was that thing of like nature coming to protect them. So you have, you have all these people stranded up a mountainside with warring factions going on round about them. And the only thing that's there to defend them and give them cover is the birds. And all the birds fly in to defend them. Um, I don't know how maybe the, there's a heaviness to the about that atmosphere and it just didn't match with anything that I found. All the work that I was uncovering at Marlborough and these collages, being in the house, everything just felt completely different mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure if I was missing something or if there, I was, there was just a different narrative that hadn't been communicated yet or, you know. So I think, yeah, I think I was really keen to explore what I saw and communicate that. Not that it's right, but just as a different kind of viewpoint, a way to access the work. But I think you, you know, the Glasgow Boys thing. Oh yeah, no, I was, I mean, I was so pleased that Lindsay, I think, just got it. You got him and you got the work. And um, the whole Glasgow Boys thing was a, a tagline that was, you know, it was a headline in the newspaper for one day and it kind of stuck and Stephen spent the whole of his career trying to distance himself from that tagline and that's no disrespect to the other painters who have the same the same thing, your Peter House and Ken Curry. I'm sure if they were standing here today they would probably say exactly the same thing. These were very disparate artists coming from very separate viewpoints and just because they happened to collide at an art school it was 
never a movement, they never ever worked together, um, and I don't think they ever saw themselves as being that group, but it's once that is hung round your neck as a label, I mean, it still is always tumbled out even today, whereas, I mean, Stephen came from much more of anything, a surrealist kind of vision of the world, very, very different to, you know, Ken coming from a very political Diego Rivera kind of viewpoint on the world, that it was just one of these things that happened and it stuck. I think, like, working in an institution, or a few institutions, I can see how that could happen so easily. You're kind of time consuming or risky to open that up because the the art world has made a decision about where something goes and it can be very difficult to overcome that. Especially if our artist is successful, because then you're challenging uh -huh, yeah, everything that's been written yeah, in yeah, that yeah. context.